Welcome back, traders and investors. We have a very spe special guest here, Doug Cass of Seabreeze Partners Management. Doug, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, and thank you for having me. Oh, our pleasure. Uh, so just you know, getting right to the market, you got uh, some nice press and barons there. You're talking about preparing for a bull market. And you talked about uh, you know, with a bear market that sometimes they emerge with speculative excess and other ends with bubbles. And you said this one could be ending with both. Where do you think the biggest bubbles are? I would say that the uh, bubbles, I would say there are eight or nine bubbles or excessive uh, valuations depending upon, upon your view. The most obvious bubble is in the IPO market where um, – more than 75% of the IPOs brought to market haven't been profitable. Um, the second area is the social media sector in which um, uh, stocks are being valued on the notion of addressable markets, much like back in, in 1999 when Internet stocks were priced relative to eyeballs. Um, as an example <laughs> of, of um, how the bubble has been embraced, Tesla, one of my favorite shorts, was able to sell two billion dollars in converts about two three months ago, after a fourfold increase in its share price. Um, they paid only fifty basis points for ten-year money, and the convert demanded a forty percent conversion uh, premium. Uh, these terms are nuts. I think the third bubble is clearly the belief that the Fed's QE policy is sufficient by itself to generate a self-sustaining domestic economic recovery. If you think about it, the shoulders of responsibility of catalyzing domestic growth have been on the Federal Reserve because our political leaders in Washington, D.C. are incompetent, inert, and, and partisan. Uh, fourthly, there's a bubble in credit. Um, when Spanish and Italian yields converge with U.S. yields, you know we have a strange situation. When Greece is... Um, able to um, sell bonds at the rate they recently did about three weeks ago, there's a problem. We're even seeing covenant light loans now at a rate which is about two times the rate in 2007 before we had problems with those financial weapons of mass destruction derivatives. There's obviously a bubble in the amount of debt as a percentage of global GDP that is held by the major central banks. There's certainly excesses and bubbles in the Chinese banking and shadow banking industries, as well as how many trillions, hundreds of trillions of dollars of derivatives uh, notional outstanding exist. And finally, there's a bubble in buybacks. Goldman Sachs reports that in March of this year, it was the busiest March on record with nearly $75 billion in buyback authorizations. For the first quarter, we saw almost 300 authorizations at a total value of nearly $200 billion. We're now on a pace of over $700 billion in authorizations for this year. That's the third most ever behind, um, the second most ever behind uh, 2007, which is the market top. And we all know that corporations typically buy high, buy high and sell low. The last time we saw this rush to buy was 2007, the year the market peaked. Okay. All these bubbles here, Doug, obviously we know bubbles get bigger. I've been in the market since 1999. I watched the tech bubble. I've watched you know, all these other different bubbles to keep inflating and inflating here. Obviously, the social media bubble and some of these Momo stocks, the bubbles kind of burst there. But overall, the market here, we're up here at 1877. We're 15 points off the all-time high. Do you think this bubble is ready to burst, or are they just going to continue to drive this higher? Like, when are these bubbles going to burst? Because I agree with you. I just don't know when it ends. Well, we we have seen the first um, we have seen what I described as the high beta earthquake, and it occurred. It began in March, early March, the first week of March, when the league leading biotech stocks began to break down, and obviously it continued for the last four or five weeks as companies like um, Amazon, Google, Priceline, Tesla, Netflix, Yelp, all got schmeist in the market. So I think this is the first shot across the bow. And um, I think investors are coming to... Uh, look, share prices have clearly benefited from a combination of massive liquidity and zero interest rate policy, but I think investors are increasingly realizing that each progressive QE 
is having a more measured impact upon domestic growth. We have um, rates now at zero. They have been for some time. QE has obviously become a blunt tool. Think about it. We've had easing for five years, and we had one-tenth of one percent real GDP in the first quarter announced yesterday. Basically, the Federal Reserve has built a bridge to growth, but they can't deliver the destination on their own. And even though a Fed run by helicopter Ben and who I call uh, Whirly Bird Janet Yellen can change how things look, they can't change what things are. Okay, a lot of your thesis here is, uh, you know, based on stock evaluations. So looking at stock evaluations, uh, two-part question here. Do you create pricing models, you know, to, for your strategies and implement them that way? And then uh, the follow-up, when the market has been at similar uh, levels as far as stock of, um, evaluations, what were the results? Um, let me ask the first question. Um, what I try to do, um, look, forecasting prospective market levels out 12 months or more um, is uh, an imprecise art form. And to me, it requires probabilistic decision-making uh, using imperfect information about an inherently unknowable future. Um, when you start going out over 12 months, it's more a function of one's philosophy than an investment prediction. But we try, especially within the next three to 12 months, to figure it out. And what I do is basically a scenario analysis. Um, in, uh, I have four basic scenarios incorporating um, economic growth expectations, interest rates, and valuation. Um, the first one is economic and I attach a probability to each one and then I just figure out what the number how the number comes out and I come out with a valuation of the S&P at around 1650 which is roughly 12% below where it is um, but I'm reminded of the quote that a, a good forecaster is not smarter than everyone else he merely has his ignorance better organized <laughs> great quote Okay, we so, are. So on, you, this sixteen fifty. The second is, question I forgot. I'm sorry. It was the second sorry. question. Um, just when the market was at similar levels for uh, stock valuations, you know, what was the market's response? Well, let me tell you. I, I'm gonna. I'm. I'm not gonna answer the question directly. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm gonna. T- I'm gonna answer it a different way. Okay. Um. To me, valuations look far too elevated for some obvious and not obvious reasons. Um, Buffett's favorite market valuation tool is market capitalization as a percentage of GDP. It's risen in the last five years from approximately 70% to 140% today. Um, Another guy, Robert Schiller at Yale, I've lectured in his class, he looks at average earnings for the S&P 500 index over 10-year periods adjusted for inflation so that 2004 can be blended with 2013. So the Schiller index ratio divides the price of the index by the earnings number. The ratio is hovering around 25 now, and that's 50% above the historical average. With regard to valuations, the fundamental problem to me is the issue of what are normalized earnings. Um, If you look at today's valuations, it seems to me it's exactly the reverse that occurred at the generational bottom of March 2009, when a lot of people, reluctant to buy into S&P at 666, thought that the market was still expensive at around 15 times, trailing 12-month earnings of around $45 a share for the S&P. But they failed to take into account how depressed earnings were vis-a-vis a higher level of normalized earnings power. So think about it. Today, investors are doing just the opposite. Mm -hmm. They're looking at projected um, consensus earnings of $120 a share. But this is anything but normal earnings. They're inflated because corporate profit margins are at a near 60-year high, and they're 72% above the average over the last six decades. So normalized earnings are well below the 120 a share, just as normalized earnings back in 2009 were well above the deflated $45 a share. So the index may appear to be trading at only about 16 and a half times 
nominal or stated earnings, but against reasonable margin assumptions, normalized earnings, the market's probably trading at a very rich 19 times. Okay, we're on live with Doug Cass of Seabreeze Partners Management. Uh, just getting his thoughts on the market. If you have any questions in the chat room, please join in. I like the questions. I love that. I like the f- freestyle in it. Okay, good. Doug, you're talking about nine bubbles you see there, and everything, in your opinion, seems to be overvalued. Is there any sectors that you like right now? Like, there's been this whole uh, rotation from momentum stocks to uh, and growth stocks into value stocks. Do you see any value in any specific sectors out there? Any like specific stocks you like or sectors you like? Uh, there are very few sectors that meet my standards of va- of uh, value. Um, there are a lot of sectors that meet my standards of overvaluation. Um, the stocks that I like are kind of one-offs, kind of bottom-up, and not necessarily sector-related. Did you want to give us an example of any of those stocks you liked? I know in Barron's you were mentioning this. Uh, sure, uh, I'll give you a couple examples. Sure. Um, let's let's start with. I like a company called. Um, where should we start? Let me give you some. Let me try to think of some ideas that are away from Barron's because all I have to do is read that. Okay. All right. You can tell how bearish Doug Cass is. He can't, he think can't of find a bearish like stock. Uh, we're going to take <laughs> a quick break shorts. and be back with Doug Cass. Okay, I'll <laughs> give you. I'll give you. I'll give you a stock that I didn't mention that I really like, um, okay. and it's a one-off. Uh, it's a it's it's a retailer based in York, Pennsylvania, with about 270 department stores, principally in the Midwest and Northeast. Uh, the company is Bonton Stores. It offers brand name fashion or apparel and accessories. Uh, under the Bonton label, Carson's, Boston Store, Bergner's, Elder Beerman, Herbinger's, and Yonkers. Um, the stock has recently sold off, uh, reflecting two conditions. Number one, the departure of the company's CEO, Brenda Hoffman. He did it for personal reasons not related to the company and the impact of the winter weather on the company's operations. Um, on the first thing, the CEO departed because of his decided to return to his family in New York. It was nothing uh, untoward about the announcement, in my view. In fact, he's being considered, I believe, for a senior position at J.C. Penney. Second, with regard to the weather's impact, um, the disappointing results uh, shouldn't come as a surprise considering the location. All the company's um, stores are in the northern, northernmost part of the country. Um, I think... I think that um, Thomas uh, Grumbacher, who is the company's chairman, is getting old. He's over 75. He owns over a million shares. Given his age and the recent management announcement, he might be incented to look at some exit strategies in the period ahead. Um, I think the company is worth, it trades at around um, 11 or $12. It's probably worth $18 on a private market transaction. And some obvious buyers could include uh, Lord and Taylor, which is um, part of the Hudson Bay operations, uh, Dillard's, and also a couple of private um, entities in the Midwest. Okay, we got a question coming out of the chat room here, and uh, what you know, BAC had a little bit of stumble there and uh, giant mistake. Uh, does this uh, foreshadow more trouble for some of the other banks uh, farther on down the line? I'm quite negative. I cut my teeth on the banking industry. Um, I actually, my master's thesis at Wharton was a book I co-wrote with Ralph Nader called Citibank, which was a relatively well-received um, a book in the in the 1970s. Um, I also was the uh, financial service um, analyst about the management after I graduated Wharton. So I know a, a, this is one of the few areas I know something about. Um, the banking industry. Um, was on a tear if you go back to February for no apparent reason. You know, a lot of price momentum players going into the group. Bank of America was a, you know, became a hedge fund um, hotel. Uh, probably every major hedge fund um, owned a large stake in the, in the, in the bank. Um, my problem with the industry is basically that the profitability is a function of several you know, well-identified and basic variables, the activity in the capital markets, the level of the loan demand, uh, FICC activity, which is trading products tied to um, 
interest rates, corporate credit, mortgages, currencies, and commodities. Obviously, the trend in credit quality, interest rates, and the slope of the yield curve. All these things are going in the wrong direction, particularly the yield curve, which has flattened dramatically this year. So I think Bank of America um, poses a real problem. It's my largest short. Um, if you look at the revenue and profit components of uh, Bank of America in the first quarter, you'll see that net interest um, margin hit a record low at 2.29%. Their net interest income was off by $1 billion relative to expectations at a little over $10 billion. The credit quality has begun to deteriorate um, as measured by their first quarter loan loss provision, which increased uh, from the fourth quarter's $330 million to over $1 billion. Their FICC revenues declined. Uh, their home tr- origination business is evaporating. Um, and um, I'm short the stock. And then, of course, we heard news of um, that the company had a capital deficiency, which they just uncovered five years later, which is horrific. So Probably the concerned? banking industry has become not only too big to fail, but too big to manage. Are you concerned about any other of the big bank stocks here? The same story could happen possibly in any I'm other I'm also ones, short or? J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo. Okay, so obviously yes. <laughs> yes. Um, also, Doug, you know, I just want to just flip it for a second. I follow you on Twitter. There, I always enjoy your tweets, and you often tweet this line: "The market has no memory." And I love that line. And I was actually thinking about it the other day as well. And, and I've been calling it like the random walk theory seems to be working here all of a sudden because this market does some funny things. It'll sell off twenty points and then rally the whole twenty points in the afternoon. Do you think right. any of this has to do with that? There's just so many. Um, you know, does it have anything to do with like the market structure, like high frequency? trading or anything that they're obviously you know doing 60 or 70 percent of the volume and they're just momentum bots out there just pushing the stocks around and there's this yeah i think that you know with 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 hft accounting for nearly 70 percent of total trading activity it's become kind of the tail that wags the dog and it's a dangerous precedent and i always i always write columns on real money pro in the street called kill the quants before they kill us (laughs) <laughs> and that's what we're seeing. But in a broader sense, the type of, you know, what I re- you know, on Twitter, I get into fights with all these guys that express the self-confidence of you. And I think it's great to have a view as long as it's, it's a rigorous view supported by fundamental reasons and analysis. But... Self-confidence is something that I, in, in myself, I try to stay away from, and, and I hate to see it from other people because, as I said, the market is, sometimes it has no memory from hour to hour. I forget about day to day. <laughs> um, and to me, the only certainty with Mr. Market is the lack of certainty. So I don't think people should be so authoritative in view and should always qualify their views with caveats like and words like will likely or possibly or might too few do that but to me there are three there are two conditions that really concern me about the market number one is the volatility and that's consistent with with that we're seeing not enough apples and too many amazons what do i mean by that we have entered a bif- we've been in a bifurcated market over the last six or nine months, and that's changing. Bifurcated markets are very difficult to analyze, but usually develop late in a cycle as part of a topping process. The two most classic examples were in 1972 and 1973 when we had these nifty 50 one decision growth stocks continued to be strong while the bulk of the stocks were weak. And obviously, in 1999 and 2000, at the end of the internet tech um, stock boom, the current situation is not as extreme as those two classic secular uh, endings, but it does, to me, fit in with a cyclical eight-stage market. Um, we've had this move recently out of because of the beta earthquake, out of high beta, high octane stocks into value stocks. To me, this is reminiscent of what happened in 2000, which presaged a major market decline or bear market. Okay, uh, Michael Lewis made a really big splash on 60 Minutes uh, with his statement that the market is rigged. I'd just like to get your opinion on that, along with that, of course, we're talking about... um, 
HFT, and then uh, you know the IEX exchange. Is that something that you're active on? I'm not active on IEX, um, um, but the market is rigged. It and is the rigged. word rigged. The, the word rigged. If you go in, if you go to the Webster dictionary, uh, basically implies that the players are playing on an uneven uh, and non-level playing field, and that is the case. And um, the recent uh, purchase by Bill Ackman, Pershing Square, of Allergen stock is another example of how the market is rigged. Um, and what this is serving to do is to, disalienate, is to alienate and disaffect the retail investor to the game. They've been, they've been clobbered by two major drawdowns in stock prices in the last 12 years. They've seen the turn of screwflation, which I coined in Barrett's in an editorial in which their wages are stagnating while the costs and necessities of life um, are increasing. We have a demographic issue. We have an aging of our population. In other words, people want to become more conservative. Uh, when they see this sort of volatility, when they see this rigging, when they see a flash crash, which is still unexplained, it turns them off, off to the markets. And it, what it does is, as their activity is limited, the individual investor's activity is limited, high-frequency traders become more and more a percentage of total volume. Right. Kill the quants before they kill us. Okay. Wow. That's wow. a that, wow. That's a very uh, very powerful quote there. Um, you know, we got a lot of problems with our you know with our budget and our, our you know our fiscal responsibilities and the deficit. I mean, you know, how can how can we deal with that? And do you have, do you have any potential solutions or where are we going? Uh, one of the things we could do is institute, which you know traders hate. Um, but you can introduce an even modest financial transactions tax, and that would evaporate each high-frequency trading because their edge would be gone. Wouldn't that just harm, if you put the financial transaction tax, that's going to hit the little guy, though, too, though, Doug, is it not? Like the little guy that's trying to trade the, It may be better for the day traders' financial well-being <laughs> <laughs> to, reduce, to reduce their level what of What if they're like an order too. cancellation tax or something instead? Would that yeah, be something better? like that. There's many yeah. permutations. That's probably a better okay. idea. Okay, we talk a lot about technical analysis and the charts, and you know, is that something that's is this part of is something that you follow? Do you think that uh, you know the old saying? I that, call I call it voodoo. Okay. <laughs> um, charts tell us where we've been, not where we're going, guys. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's what they say. At uh, you know, at the bottom of uh, the sea, there's a bunch of ships, and they've all have a chart room in it, right? You know, that's so that, right. That's the thing. Well so, okay, so definitely. I mean, you, you touched on, you know, the uh, you, you were talking about like the the deals that have gone on and things that are going on in Twitter. You know, Ackman with this, uh, you know, getting involved in this deal. I mean, to me, uh, you know, just being a you know a simpleton boy. I mean, if you know someone's taken over a company and then you. are in cahoots with that company, and you go out and you buy that stock, I mean, you know, where where are we going to draw the line on this? I think it's a bunch of crap that he's allowed to do it. That's all I'll say. Okay. To me, it's front-running. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's front-running cubed, um, and I don't understand, but I don't know. It's the SEC has... Seems like there's different rules for different people out there, Doug, and that's really what the little guy I think you know. Is a famous trader on the market. floor once said, once said to me, Joe Gruss, legendary trader. He said, "The rich get richer and the poor go to prison." Wow, and then, and some of that is the truth in that too. Wow. Okay, Doug, you talk about being in the market and shorting the market. Do you, uh, do, you know, do you use the actual equities? Do you use options, futures? And, like, do you also have, like, you know, just, like, catastrophic insurance on – it doesn't sound like you're long a whole lot, but do you, you – know, I, um, I, by nature, I'm a guy that sees the glass as half empty. In fact, my, managed, my accounts that I manage and partnerships that I manage – are, are are long short, but they're short biased, and I would say 99.9% .9 of the long short managers are long biased. 
So that's I'm always almost always in the next short position. Um, and I do think that in theory, you know, the, what you look, I have, you know, I've also learned something else that shorting isn't for everyone. You know, reward versus risk is asymmetric. You can only lose, you know, you can only make a hundred percent if you find a bankruptcy, but you can lose a multiple or an infinite amount of money if you're wrong. It requires tremendous price discipline and risk control, which many investors don't have. It involves taking a lot of small losses, so it's not for everyone. Yeah, risk-reward ratio is something that we talk a lot. So uh, we're on with Doug Cast here of Seabreeze Partners Management, uh, giving uh, his uh, bearish thesis on the markets. Uh, Doug, Let's get more questions. We got more questions. Okay, they're coming for you here. Okay, what, Todd? E., uh, what is your most hated sector? Hmm. I think that the entire social media sector. We're going to look back. And most of these stocks will decline by between 50 and 70 percent. As I said, the notion of addressable markets, the size of addressable market, has replaced eyeballs in 1999. It's a dangerous situation. I think that the the beta earthquake that we've seen, the decline in all these high beta, high octane stocks since early March, is a strike across the bow and foreshadows weakness ahead. Okay, uh, Steve Jobs, Warren Buffett, not big fans of splitting stocks here. Apple's doing everything to make their stock go up, except you know create new products. How how do you t- how do you view that that upcoming split in the stock? Um, it's obviously been viewed favorable by the markets. To me, it's a bit of uh, financial engineering, and I think it's part and parcel of the fact that this, once the stock stock which is which was on its ass, started to rally off the better, the slightly better than expected earnings in the quarter and better guidance, coupled with an increase in the dividend payout and obviously the seven to one split. It got the stock moving and it got the price momentum guys and day traders back into the stock, and that's what we're seeing. It will peter out. Okay. I mean, everyone uh, has a mentor and people that they've learned from in the business. I like to read different books from uh, different people involved in the markets. Who, you know, who do you look up to and who, who do you think that you've uh, learned the most from and about the markets? I would say from a trading standpoint, I've, I have a, a mentor that I look up most that people don't know, know him very well. He's kind of a legendary figure in Boston. I call him the chief. His name is Jerry Jordan because he's part Indian. <laughs> okay. And um, he's one of the most brilliant traders I've ever met. Um, he has this uncanny ability to overweight and pick out very early uh, the one sector or sectors in the market that are market leaders. It's just, just amazing. And um, I, I've learned to be in a aggressive trader from him. From a fundamental standpoint, there is no one better in the world than Lee Cooperman, one of my advisors, who goes belly to belly with companies, who knows often companies as well as the CFO of the very companies he manages, he uh, invests in. You reading any good books right now? Um... Uh, I just wrote a book. <laughs> okay, all right. I don't really have time. I get up before I get. I start my day at four fifteen in the morning and end it around six thirty at night. And I wanted to be quite honest. I used to read a lot more than I do now. Um, you know, I have a list of uh, favorite investment books, including um, The Alchemy of Finance from George Soros, obviously Graham and Dodd Security Analysis. Um, I think that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the the poker player Doyle Bronson's book Super System, a course on power poker, is is a tremendous book to read for the for the traders. Uh, Irrational Exuberance by Robert Schiller at Yale, of course, that I I've lectured in. Um, uh, David Einhorn's Fooling Some of the the People All of the Time is was a great 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 read. Anything Jim Grant writes, minding Mr. Mark, it's uh, money of the mind, sensational. Leon Levy's uh, book, I forget the name of it, 
Um, Bernie Kornfeld wrote a book called Do You Sincerely Want to Be Rich, which examines the psychology of the investor. And finally, Jerry Goodman, a.k.a. Adam Smith, wrote a book called The Money Game in the late 60s. He just died in January, which um, every every investor and trader should read. Uh, George Soros and Soros on Soros was a great book. And Barton Biggs, Hedgehogging was a great book. You know, I read these. I probably read each of these ten times or more. Oh, really? So you read them a time and time again. Another side. Yeah, but sa- I just wrote a book called I, I, which will be out in the fall or early winter with John Wiley. The first of two books I signed on for. Um, Doug Cast on the Market: A Life on the Street, which references my. Uh, the last uh, 15 years of contributions in writing a, a, a blog every day for the street, Jim Kramer's The Street. Okay, we're uh, we're on with Doug Cass of Seabree Partners Management sharing his views on the market. Uh, talking about bubbles in different sectors and whatnot, boy, the, the, do you follow the marijuana sector at all? I used to smoke a lot of marijuana when I was in college, but I don't follow the group. You, you, you don't um, you don't follow that sector then? No, no. I just think it's. Um, I think your money will go up in smoke. To reference Cheech and Chong, if you invest in this group. Okay. All right. A little bit too speculative. Okay. Um, and uh, just moving on here, and, and we did see this is going back to Barron's as far as having things that you want, and this relates to QE and tapering and your interest rate outlook. That you like some closed end muni bond funds and. Uh, what what would change your mind to re- reevaluate uh, that position? I would say if the net a- if the discounts and net asset value move toward parity, just towards zero, they're still at around six or seven percent. And I had a different view of interest rates. If I thought rates would go up dramatically over the near term, I would move away from that. But it is it is a lesson. I actually wrote an article this morning on the on Real Money Pro, which is part of the street. Um, entitled The Tortoise and the Hare. Um, you know, you look at this group in mid, mid-December, mid I bought, uh, I made a case for buying the group. Um, on average, the 14 funds I purchased are up 13% this year. And the moral of the story is sometimes, like in the Aesop's tale, um, the tortoise beats the hare. Sometimes ingenuity, creativity, analysis wins the big race. And sometimes we don't have to buy these high beta, high octane stocks to deliver superior returns. Okay, just a, this is a real general question here because we've had we have investors in the chat room that have very little money in the market, that, people that have larger amounts of money. But if you had to give one tip to investors that have anywhere from you know five or ten thousand dollars in the market, you know going on up, let's say to you know to five million or fifty million, what would be the best single piece of advice that you could give investors today? Um, I would say that the real money in the investment business is made by long-term investors. Patience is a virtue. Catch it if you can. Always in a woman, but never in a man. Uh, It's very important to... um, Stick tight with the thesis. Um, if Mr. Market um, uh, provides you an opportunity to buy an asset at a sharp discount, uh, don't be swayed by negative sentiment, which has created that opportunity. Be disciplined and buy. Um, in the long run, there's a gravitational pull, despite my proclivity towards short selling, there's a gravitational pull towards higher prices. Okay, so it you know besides I mean you have your thesis and a lot of times like during the financial crisis you know we didn't see it coming just you know to to end the interview here you know what do you think is going to be you know the catalyst or the tipping point is going to be companies start lowering their earning projections is going to be something that's going on in 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 the Ukraine uh, with Russia I mean what you know what is going to be the tipping point I think the tipping point is going to be that it is clear that the economic recovery uh, domestically is uh, going, to, going to be subpar after recovery of the second quarter, and that as a consequence 
uh, earnings will be disappointing. And what sectors do you think? I mean, so far, no one's guiding the street lower. What do you think are to be some of the first sectors to, you know, to, to fess up that uh, lower earnings are on the horizon? Well, I think unlike stocks, housing is subject to the real economy. Um, real wages are declining. Uh, newer investors like hedge funds, private equity have lifted home prices because they bought home pri- homes to sell, uh, to rent. Housing affordability is taking a bite out of the market, it's going to get worse. Um, and I think housing will be the first disappointment. Okay. All right. Uh, I just see our value investor, uh, Tim Melvin, hopped in here, and uh, you know he's trying to hey, find... Hey, Tim. Tim writes with me in, uh, on the street. Okay. And, uh, and Tim is, you know, he's trying to find value in the markets. We have him on the show and he's having a really hard time finding uh, value stocks. But uh, he does, you talked about some of the big banks. He sees some kind of the, uh, perhaps some some value in some of these smaller regional banks, perhaps them being uh, acquired mergers and acquisitions. What's your What's your view? I, I, we we got your take on uh, the larger banks. How about uh, some of the? I smaller? have actually one one uh, regional bank holding. Tim's aware of uh, Northwest Bank Shares NWBI. Just paid a one dollar special dividend out this week. Pays uh, forty two cent uh, regular cash dividend. Trades around uh, thirteen bucks um, in basically a regional in the western part of Pennsylvania in the fracking country, and it's a play on um, uh, increased fracking. And um, possible M and A target. Okay. All right. And uh, so this round of earnings uh, that we've had is still pretty rosy. So you, you know, second quarter, third quarter, you think a little bit farther on down. I, I don't think the earnings are so rosy. I think on a, you know, um, about seventy percent of the earnings have been beaten. But I call these beats the Twit Olympics. If you ever saw Monty Python's Twit Olympics, where the contestants um, event is jumping over matchbook covers. <laughs> you know, basically, investor relations departments and corporate managers manage expectations, and those expectations are always met by a penny or or less or more. And um, I think it's no accomplishment that 70% of the profit expectations have been increased. The fact is, the average weighted increase relative to expectations is less than 2%. Okay. All right. Well, we've had Doug Cass on of Seabreeze Partners Management giving us a, a broad perspective on the market. Uh, caution to investors. Doug, thanks Thanks so much for taking the time out this morning uh, to come. Thanks for having yeah. me anytime. I enjoyed it. Thank you. We'll surely have you on again. Thanks, guys. All right.